And welcome everybody to the Ingram Angle live from Washington. Trump versus the smart set. That's the focus of tonight's angle. The media drumbeat continued today and into the night about all the salacious tidbits in the new White House tell-all by Michael Wolff. Among the most oft-repeated tropes in the book are that President Trump is not smart, he doesn't read, he's not curious. You know, he's just kind of a village idiot type. According to Wolf's book, and many of this has been pushed back on, by the way, uh, former Deputy Chief of Staff Katie Walsh thought the White House was incompetently run. Treasury Secretary Steve Munchen and former Chief of Staff Reince Priebus believe Trump to be an idiot. Gary Cohn, the president's top economic advisor, regards Trump as, quote, dumb. And the president's top national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, considers him, according to this book, to be, quote, a dope. Well, of course, all of this thrilled the lefty cable nitwits and bitter never Trumpers. Some of the more salacious entries, the fact that Donald Trump doesn't read. Well, you know, we told you that a year and a half ago. The assessments all consistent of the closest people to the president working with him as being essentially a child. He's a child. He's got no attention span. He reads nothing. It's even worse than it seems. Uh, this is an idiot surrounded by clowns. The behavior, the disposition of the president, they say he's acting like a child. The horrible choice you have to make is do I stay here and work with this child who behaves like uh, an arrogant fool, behaves like a baby. Pot, kettle, black, Joe. Well, of course, they're all joy enjoying this moment where Team Trump seems to be piling on the president because they all think it validates their own views that Donald Trump is just a troglodyte who lucked out by winning the presidency. And by the way, he eats a lot of bad food. Okay, I'm going to hand it to them. I think they're right about this. Trump isn't into artisanal cheeses. He doesn't munch on kale and down coconut water. But most of the rest of this stuff is just goofy. First, do these perpetual grousers realize that when you call him an imbecile, you are, in effect, saying the same of his supporters? I mean, I'm not a political soothsayer, but I don't think that's a great political strategy for expanding your own movement. And by the way, I still remember what the intellectuals of the late 1970s and the 80s frequently said about my old boss, Ronald Reagan. Remember, he was unintelligent, he slept in the afternoons, he went to a second-rate college, just an actor shallow. Well, look, Trump isn't Reagan. No one ever will be. Reagan was a man for his own time. He was a former two-term governor of California who wrote and thought a lot about conservatism. But like Reagan, Trump is extremely sharp and he has the pulse of the people. And I know, because I've seen, he has an uncanny ability to connect with their hopes and their desires. And like Reagan, he reminds Americans that what makes us special is our people. It's our freedom. It's not our government. And as for the so-called smart, educated people who are now criticizing Trump, I have a few questions. Was it smart to enact policies that ended up enriching the repressive regime in China at the expense of American workers, American companies, and American security? And was it smart to leave our borders open, like Swiss cheese allowing illegals to stream into the United States? taking American jobs, saddling taxpayers with the cost of educating them, housing them, providing them with health care? Was it smart to get into some wars that ended up draining our country of trillions of dollars, took the lives of so many of our finest men and women? Was it smart to explode our foreign population, not through a smart merit-based immigration system, but through the ludicrous policy of chain migration? Was it smart to borrow trillions from other countries, only to send hundreds of billions to countries who hate us? Is it smart to create a government-mandated health care system that drove so many doctors out of their practices, jacked up premiums and out-of-pocket costs, and led to canceled policies? I don't think so. Trump friend and political operative Roger Stone put it this way on my radio show today. Donald Trump is his own chief strategist. He's also his own speechwriter, his own phrase maker, his own press secretary in many senses. Uh, and he's obviously very good at it. Yes, Donald Trump is an eccentric. 
Yes, he does things his way. Yes, he is not like every other president that you can think of who was packaged, who was fabricated, who, who was being handed, you know, uh, polling and, and focus groups and, and, and discussions of how to say things that would make you popular against enormous odds by taking on the two-party duopoly and the, the elites of both parties that, who have, let's face it, run the country into the ground. He's a genius. So maybe Donald Trump doesn't pour over Robert Caro's latest doorstop-sized biography or have dog-eared copies of Plato's Republic on his bedside table. Big deal. He had great schooling, but he never pretended to be an academic. Not many people are. But what did he do? He exposed and named the pretenders, those elites in politics, media, and business who helped drive America into a ditch. And by the way, no matter how badly their policies and ideas failed the people, those fraudsters are almost never held accountable. So tired of seeing America lose, Trump revealed their agendas, he named them, and he made us see the, them to be the frauds that they are. And by the way, they've been vengeful ever since, furious. Well, what's the point of being smart if you never learn? Trump was smart enough to see that someone needed to step up to be the voice of the forgotten man and woman, and he beat all those supposedly savvy and experienced campaigners with their focus group tested talking points and slick ad campaigns. It's smart to put Americans and their interests first, and Donald Trump is out there still listening to the people who count. You. I was in New York at a big event recently, and I take a lot of pictures with police and with firemen and with uh, the military. And one of the policemen came up, an officer, and he said, sir, I want to thank you. My 401k is through the roof. My wife thinks I'm a brilliant investor. I've never seen anything like it. My wife is so happy. My family is so happy. Dumb? I don't think so. He's telling the stories that people want to hear, personalizing, sterile statistics, charts and graphs, real anecdotes. and. Though, you know, I gotta say, thinking about dumb, I'd feel pretty dumb if I'd been one of those GOP donors who was snookered into writing a million dollar check to Jeb Bush's super PAC, or if maybe in late October 2016, I'd put down a payment on a house in Georgetown because I was sure that Hillary Clinton would win and I'd be working in her administration. There's a brilliance in Trump's political strategy. Perhaps his greatest instinct was a simple message that resonated most with his core supporters, build the wall. That promise was sacrosanct, and it helped him get elected. The best thing Trump can do is to stick to his core campaign promises, especially that one. He's not going to fall, I don't think, for what the failed elites might be trying to sell him. They may have more political experience, and a lot of them do. But he has better instincts than most of them, and most Americans will see that his thinking is exactly the type of unconventional thinking that at times is disruptive that we need right now. And that's the angle. Joining me now for reaction is Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House and a Fox News contributor. Newt, it's so good to have you back from Rome. How are you? Are you, are you perpetually jet lagged? That's my question. No, no, it's fun. Uh, let's talk about what they are trying to do. The usual suspects, you know all of them. You saw that tedious montage. Trump's not smart, he's dumb, he's unintelligent, he doesn't read, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's going on here? Well, I mean, the same people who have been uh, passionately avoiding reality for three years are now entering a new year passionately avoiding reality. You know, you, there's a whole series of these things. Where, where I'm working on a book right now called Trump's America, and there's a whole chapter of how wrong they are. I mean, whether, whether it's somebody saying he couldn't possibly be elected, a number of people who said the stock market is going to crash the minute he's sworn in. <laughs> I mean, you go back and you pick these people up. I, I have a standard rule. If I look at the Sunday morning shows and all of the wonderful elite Washington figures have agreed that the sky is going to be blue, I, my assumption immediately is it's not because they're just they're, they're, they're wrong so often. So let, let's take the case of, of the current. And the, the other thing, by the way, is the news media loves living in the Kardashian age. There is no story too small, no semi scandal too stupid. For them to not spend a day or two just frothing about it. So, I, and, and you've had the same experience. 
Trump is actually, he was smart enough to beat 16 other Republicans. Uh, he was smart enough to beat Hillary Clinton. He was smart enough to help uh, Mitch McConnell and, and Paul Ryan pass the largest tax cut in modern times. He's been smart enough to begin to put, get federal judges in who are solidly conservative. He's smart enough to have the largest deregulation, larger than Reagan, largest deregulation in history in the first year. So somewhere in all that, you'd think, maybe he's actually smart. I mean, do, do dumb people get elected president of the United States? I mean, truly dumb people. I mean, you look, you are the academic. Give me the dumb person who was ever elected president. Warren, Warren G. Harding, uh, Buchanan. You have to go back a ways. Yeah. Um, they're, they're trying to set up a narrative, Newt, of Trump as unstable, mentally deficient, uh, can't be trusted with a nuclear <laughs> button. You're seeing pieces, not just in places like CNN, if Brian Stetler was, had a piece today about how the, the salacious details of that Wolf book aren't important. More important uh, is his, um, that the book suggests that Trump is unstable and raises alarms about his fitness for office. You've heard this building really, but we heard it from Corker, we've heard it from people all the way back to last January, frankly. The bombs start falling on Moscow in 10 minutes. That was not Donald Trump. That was Ronald Reagan. During a test. Was it five Re minutes or ten minutes? I think it was I five. I thought it was ten. You know, okay. But in either, event, in either event. Let's do can, Reagan trivia right now. Go. Let's call okay. Craig Shirley. But in either event, can you imagine how the current media would have dealt with that? Oh, my God. That was one of Reagan's best lines as oh, well. It was, it, was, it was a throwaway baloney line, and he knew it, and so did the Russians. Uh, but what did Reagan do that Trump doesn't? Reagan let it all kind of slide off his back. He did not... Yeah, engage with the media. It was a different time. You didn't have Twitter. They're, they're both. I mean, I think you said it well earlier. Ronald, I actually do think, and I thought, I've, I've known nine presidents. I think these are the two best. This, this will shock some people. I think Reagan and Trump. Totally. Very, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Not even close. And in terms of actual effectiveness, yeah. these are the two best presidents that, that I've known, starting back with, with Nixon. Um, but they're totally different. Uh, Brian Kilmeade has a new book, as you know, on the Battle of New Orleans and Andrew Jackson. And I keep telling everybody, if you read Kilmeade's book, if you look at Andrew Jackson, you begin to understand Trump. Reagan is this stunningly sophisticated person who had been a Hollywood star. He really understood himself. He really understood the media. And he had a totally different style than Trump. Trump is a rough-and-tumble businessman who never acquired any of Reagan's, you know, style, but who understands, I want to get that done. That story about the police officer, or the firefighter with yeah. the 401k, he gets in with the people. I always love seeing him on the factory floor, putting his arm around someone. That, that's, that's the Trump I think we need to see more of. Now, I, I like his tweets. I think his tweets are almost always effective. So I like his tweets. But the, getting involved, like the, Bannon says this, Trump says this, they're friends, they're not friends. I got to have you weigh in on Bannon and, and, and what's going on there. I, I, I can't figure it out. I don't know who's helped sure, by it. Oh, sure you can. Bannon is a person, and, and we both work with Steve. He was, a, he was a very smart, very interesting student of what's going on in America. He, he read his own headlines, many of which he planted. Uh, he wasn't the chief strategist. Donald Trump was already the nominee before Bannon showed up, and Bannon had a marginal impact in the fall campaign. Uh, he really, at some levels, he's almost irrational. Uh, you, you go into the Trump White House, and you think, I guess I'll pick a fight with Jared and Ivanka, and then I'll pick a fight with Don Jr. This is suicidal. I mean, these are the kind of things where you have to say, you know, are you just crazy? Then, are you saying Steve Bannon's insane? Well, the president said, I think, that he had lost his mind, and that may be a more appropriate way to put it, because insane has certain, you know, psychological preconditions. I, I, what I do think is that Bannon thought... Somebody once said to me that Tiger Woods' caddy actually thought he made the putts and forgot that, in fact, it was helpful to have Tiger Woods. As long as he didn't drive the car yeah. in the last... Yeah. Uh, but, but if you think, about it, if you think about it, Bannon thought that he had the skills that Trump has. Well, and he, he might run for does. president. I mean, the reports are he could think of running for president. That would be fine. He'll get, uh, you know, 3%. 
uh, and uh, be part of the continuation. I think actually this experience probably eliminates most of his support financially. Uh, John Cornyn, senator from Texas, said the falling out with Bannon may be a good thing for the Republican Party. See, what I'm worried is the ricochet thing. Bannon is a conservative populist. I agree with him on almost every issue, frankly. Uh, he is very smart. He is a student of history. I don't know what's behind these quotes. I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. But I don't want Trump to to take the Bannon problem and take the lesson from that being I'm not going to do these issues that you know that we agreed on together because I think they are they were good together. I'm not saying Bannon was Trump. Trump's Trump. I, look, I, they I were think, good first together. First of all, I think Steve Miller. I'm trying to be a, a men fences here for people. Yeah, That's good, what I'm trying good, to do. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> over. Well, what can I do? I'm trying. I don't to give. You. Look, Go ahead. For, first of all, Stephen Miller is the heart of, of love the, him. Right, and and he he has all of Bannon's upside and none of his downside. Quiet. Right. He's there doing his job every single day. Yep. He, he, I think he probably channels Trump better than anybody in the country. Second, I actually have, this is like Reagan. I, I remember as early as the summer of 82, conservatives going to lunch at Heritage going, oh, my God, Reagan's selling us out. I mean, oh, yeah, right, right. I, have, I have enormous faith that Reagan was actually Reagan. I have enormous faith that Trump is actually Trump. Trump actually believes this stuff. He believes in deregulation. He believes in well, he's cutting got taxes. It. This is what I'm saying. These conservatives still grousing. So, so I, I don't worry about Bannon. Television. I don't worry about Bannon leaving uh, as long as Trump stays. Uh, Sessions, uh, a couple of congressmen, Meadows and uh, Jordan said that Sessions should probably step aside. They, it might be time for him to step aside. What do you think about that? I, I, think that I think that Attorney General Sessions ought to have a very serious review of what he's doing because he has a department that has enormous problems. He can't recuse himself from all those problems. And he ought to be, if, if he were still in the Senate, he would be yeah. really angry at him as Attorney General. And I, mean, I like Jeff a lot. Me and too. and uh, I hope that he will decide that he is going to clean house and get the job done. Now they're opening up a couple new investigations, so yeah. uh, we'll see. Newt Gingrich, love having you on. Great Thank to you be so with much. You. Give my Thanks. best to your ambassador. Do you call ambassador or ambassadress? What am I? No, she's an ambassador. Ambassador. It's no female. I will. I actually, she prefers you call her Calista. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> tell hi. Say, say, uh, tell Calista I said it. hi. Please do. Uh, by the way, the suddenly intense feud between Bannon and, uh, and the president we just talked about took another surprising turn today. We're going to talk to someone who has not spoken out on this issue and an exclusive. Stay right here. You do not want to miss it. Speculation is swirling that Steve Bannon could soon be out at Breitbart after President Trump said his former top aide had, quote, lost his mind. That followed the pre-release ex excerpt from a book that claimed Bannon had called a June 2016 meeting between Trump and campaign staff and some uh, Russians, a Russian lawyer, as treasonous and unpatriotic. Now, many people quoted in the book, Fire and Fury, uh, by Michael Wolff, are denying making critical comments about the president or his staff, but Bannon has not. So let's turn to someone who was there, Bannon's uh, you know, deputy during the presidential campaign, New York Times best-selling co-author of Let Trump Be Trump. Congratulations to Dave Bossy. Great to see you. How are you doing, man? I'm great. Thank I bet you you're happy me. you're not in the White House, right? I am, and I'm very happy. Oh. I'm happy that our book is doing Oh, no, I'm so happy for you. And uh, let's talk about what's going on here, because the, the left is treating this like it is... Finally, it's like manna from heaven for them. These Bannon yes. comments are, are released. Book is now out on tomorrow. They've sped up the publication. This is like a PR. Yes. Uh, this is a PR dream for every writer. The White House attacks the book, tries to say the book. Well, the book shouldn't come out. Threatening to sue. What's happening? This book seems to be National Enquirer on steroids. None it of it's is, true. It sens it's just sensational journalism. It's not journalism. It is. Uh, it, it, I, I'm concerned about what is true and what isn't true. This author has a history of of of, of taking liberties with things. I'm deeply concerned uh, about what my friend, you know, uh, Steve Bannon has has said to this person. Look, I, I don't believe for a minute that he wasn't that, even at the camp. He wasn't no. even at the campaign when that meeting took place. Well, and 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 the, 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 nothing in that meeting was unpatriotic, or it was a fairly standard meeting for anybody who's involved well, in first, a campaign. Yeah, first of all, the word treasonous has real uh, legal implications and a prerequisite. So you, you the, the Don idea Jr. That Don Jr. You know. is a very patriotic. 
man, I, I, I have spent a lot of time with him. He's, yeah, he's well, the furthest but, thing from that. And so I just, I take great yeah. umbrage. Well, Steve hasn't denied things. the comments. No, he has not no, denied the no. comments, but he also today said that, like, we're, there's, nothing's going to come between the Trump agenda and me or Breitbart. Setting, setting him aside, though, why would the White House think it was a good idea to allow Michael Wolff to park himself in the West Wing lobby, where I've sat many times waiting for meetings and so forth, waiting for interviews. And then basically he was given carte, you know, carte blanche to talk to top aides. I know that because they've told me that. They, they, he, they were told by one individual who was, I guess, speaking for the president, talk to X, Y, Z, and they all talked. Yeah. And he has tapes. It, it seems, well, he says he has tapes. We haven't seen well, or heard of president said he had a tape once, too. I'm joking. I'm just like, <laughs> that <laughs> well, just came to mind. Yeah. I don't know. Wolf, yeah. Wolf is, is somebody who did have access. And it but is why pretty give, surprising. Why, why if, think for, that Michael Wolf is going to do anything to help advance the Trump agenda or even, frankly, be fair? He's never. He was never going to be, and I. And I don't know why they did you, that. It is, what, it's the what? biggest error. It's one of the biggest mistakes. And now we're off the agenda. We're not talking about the oh, success. We're getting into DACA reform. next segment. <laughs> well, I, I hope so. But we, the president, just has the momentum coming out of this tax reform package and a great bill, and 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 the economy is steaming along, and then we get it. Why is Steve Bans lost his mind? Just say, look, Steve has his own views, and like, look, I mean. You know, I have so I did the whole Ingram angle about the smarts of Donald Trump, how he outfoxed it's everyone. The great best, political instincts. The best political instincts I've ever seen. But don't keep the news cycle going on a topic that's not helping you. That's what, and, and I get it. You want to defend yourself. I understand that. He's a. But look, I, he's I get the best that. counterpuncher that we've ever seen. Yes, Ask Hillary Clinton. We also and, don't punch down. Don't no, punch you, down. You don't. But when this book, this, the, these people, the mainstream media, want to use everything at their disposal, the other, the other cable networks are just course, salivating over. But they're this. just selling more books now. That's all they're doing, and that's what the whole game is about. Let's let's make no bones about it. It's to it's to fill Michael Wolf's pockets. Now, um, I didn't speak to Michael Wolf. A lot of people spoke to him. I'm like, yeah, I see a quote from me there. I don't, I don't talk to those people. Um, I haven't seen the book yet. So. Well, I, I, I didn't speak to him, so I know I'm not quoted. But um, let, 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 let's talk about the, the, the elite's criticism of Donald Trump as disengaged, as uninformed, as now they're making the argument that he is he could have neurological problems. These, these articles are actually not appearing just in left-wing websites either. But it's a joke. Look, this is, the, the president is an incredibly well-educated, well-read, and, and very smart guy. You don't get to be president of the United States if you're not. Uh, Dave Bossie, congratulations on the book. So proud of you. And it was a page turner. I, I gave a couple copies for Christmas gifts, oh, by the way. You. I still got to get you to sign them. Uh, <laughs> thanks so that. much. And they're the dreamers. This must be done now. There is an urgent need. Obama couldn't do it. Bush couldn't do it. I think you can do it. There's a deal to be had. If you want it bad enough, we'll get it. We need a physical border wall. We're going to have a wall. Remember that. We're going to have a wall. As you can hear, jousting continues over creating a DACA compromise. The president is determined to have a border wall and real enforcement. To give you a sense of what's at stake and the high cost of illegal immigration, let's go to Don Rosenberg in Calabasas, California. His son, Drew, was killed in a 2010 car crash by an illegal immigrant. who He entered the country illegally. He was from Honduras. He ultimately was given legal status because of that hurricane. But when he came in, he came in illegally. Now you don't have your son. Don. Uh, it's always good to see you, but my heart always breaks for you anew every time I do see you, because I know when you start hearing Republicans obsess over amnesty for 800,000 people brought here when they were young, it's got to it's gotta just wear on you. Well, Laura, thanks for having me, and it, it certainly does. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that Americans are willing to sacrifice other Americans, both jobs, lives, um, in deference to people that are in the country illegally. <laughs> and certainly it's all the Democrats, and now we've got a lot of Republicans coming on board, too. It's absolutely outrageous, and the public shouldn't stand for it. You know, when I speak with families who've been so brutally affected by the scourge of illegal immigration, 
they have repeatedly said from California to Nevada to Texas, no one even bothered to ask us questions before Donald Trump. They didn't talk to us. They didn't sit down with us. They didn't give us a hug. Didn't hear from President Obama. Didn't hear from uh, you know George W. Bush. That they, they tr Trump was it for them. Finally, they had a voice. Yeah, well, I, they, yeah, you couldn't be more accurate than that. I mean, I I can tell you from so many of the people that I'm you know that I'm now friends with, because we've lost somebody you know back in the Obama days. We wrote to him. I wrote to him twice. Had the letter delivered by uh, someone in Jay Johnson's staff. Never even a condolence response back. Um, I've written to many senators and congressmen, no response. Um, they, they just ignore us, which is incredible. And the same thing with a lot of the media, the LA Times, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, or any of the, any of the Tribune publications, they'll run story after story, you know, a heartbreaking story that some illegal aliens being deported and all they did was, you know, oh, yeah. uh, embe embezzle money and then somebody gets killed, you'll find it nowhere, nowhere. Don, in the you know what I call those? I call those immigration sob stories. I do them regularly on the radio. It's and every illegal immigrant is a valedictorian or has rescued a cat from a tree. I mean, there is never an illegal immigrant in most of these news accounts that's ever so much as jaywalked. Okay, so your stories, right. <laughs> you know, the the robberies, the, you know, and so when Donald Trump orig originally made that point, you know, we talked about rapes and so forth. They didn't like the way he phrased it, but what he was getting at is, you're not, you're not receiving the full story on this. I'm going to tell the story of those men and women and their families who have been so horrifically affected because these politicians haven't done their job. And I got to say, the Republicans and Democrats watching this, your, your solemn duty is to the American people. The American people, not to the people of other countries who came here illegally, but to legal immigrants and to American citizens. Donald Trump understands that. I don't think he's going to, you know, sell out people on immigration. If he does, he's over anyway. So he's going to be done. If he well, sells uh, us out on immigration, Donald Trump will not be reelected president of the United States. I can tell you that right now. And yeah, uh, I, I, come, I, hope... I come as someone who was a great supporter of his. So, and you can close it out. Yeah, I hope not. I mean, the problem is that the public doesn't really know what's going on because they're not being told. You know, I mean, you know, Kate Steinle is killed and half the country thinks she's the first person ever killed by an illegal alien. And the other half of the country never heard of her. The reality is we're talking over 50,000 deaths since the last, uh, you know, immigration reform. No, and no, now no, what it's... do we want? To and now they want yeah. to do the same thing. No, no, no. It can't. So it's, it's, no, it's you know, outrageous. No, it, can't, it can't be the promise of enforcement and immediate amnesty. That never works. It didn't work before, and it's not going to work now. And by the way, you don't want to miss this next segment. It's a little notice story that could turn into huge news. And what Fox News can now confirm about the reopening of, you got it, the Hillary Clinton email investigation next. Breaking news for you tonight, Fox News can now confirm the Justice Department is taking another look at Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server as Secretary of State. Investigators are examining how classified material ended up on her unsecured server, how much was sent, who sent it, and which of the original federal investigators knew about all of this. Fox can also confirm that the Justice Department is now investigating whether the Clinton Foundation engaged in any pay-to-play schemes while Hillary was Secretary of State. Two big developments. So let's discuss all of this with Peter Schweizer, who's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Clinton Cash, who's in Tallahassee, Florida. And here with me in studio is Philip Reins, who's the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State to Hillary Clinton. It's great to see both of you. Um, Philip, let's start with you. Uh, the Justice Department, the FBI, are, are taking another look. No matter how you phrase it, looks like they're investigating this anew. What's your take? Let's first start with the email server. Well, listening to that, it's amazing that the Department of Justice has anything else, any time to do anything else. Um, I would say two things. First, I think there's a problem with uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI looking at something over and over again because there are people who don't like the outcome. This has been investigated and concluded. But I'll say this, rather than fight it, um, have at it. If they want to look at it, 
if we didn't do anything wrong, we have nothing to fear. People who are innocent don't fire the FBI director. The second thing I would add is if they're going to do this, expand it. So it's been six to nine years. Let's see what's happened since. Let's see about email practice. Let's see about the system. There are people now. We have Jared and Ivanka who were caught using private email last year in the White House. I haven't heard anything about that. Let's put them on that, too. Let's have Rudy Giuliani and the New York field office. Okay, Let's so take a look at that. I don't, I, you're a really smart guy. And Thank you. I don't. I bet you didn't send emails to a Yahoo account, or did you? Well, did you ever send government emails to another account that included any confidential or classified information like Huma Abedin did? Did you ever do that? Not to a personal account, but it's funny you ask. This is an email that I sent that has been classified. It's been redacted, so I'm not holding anything. This is an email that I sent to the secretary who doesn't reply. I don't say anything. But take a look at where it comes from. This is, has one of the most senior members of the White House as part of the sending group. Why aren't we looking at this? We should be, because this is a systemic problem. This is on the Internet. <laughs> this was foia by Judicial Watch. Right. This so your view released. is that your view is that there was a deletion of emails. None, none of that at the Department of State when she was there. None of that was in any way problematic. I mean, Comey thought it she, was problematic. She has said it was dumb. Yeah, Comey, but, Comey originally said it was it was. Well, gross, I think he was, was prejudging it. I know you think yeah, that he watered yeah. down. I think right. he was yeah. hiding Let's it. Let's go to Peter Schweizer, who wrote a book in in, in part about uh, this. Peter, you heard what uh, Philip said. About this, that look, we gotta, if you want to do it, broaden the investigation into general email practices, and then we'll talk about the Clinton Foundation. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a good idea, but I think there's a, a fundamental difference. There's a difference uh, when Colin Powell, as Secretary of State, was using an AOL account occasionally for correspondence and setting up your own private server. Why do you set up a private server? If you have the AOL account, you can delete it on your laptop, but it's on a server back at AOL. The reason you set up a server, I believe, the reason the Clintons did is precisely because of what they did. They deleted 33,000 emails and turned only 30,000 over to the State Department. And the FBI, by the way, concluded that not all of those deleted were personal emails, that they deleted those that were business related as well. So I, I appreciate the spirit with which he's saying broaden the investigation. I would agree with that. But I do think there's a fundamental difference between having a server in a private email account and just having a private email account. We don't know that, that Jared and Ivanka Trump don't have a server in their apartment. You think they? Oh, have I agree. Private, I would say I, I think they can afford oh, that's, it. I'm sure that I'm, <laughs> I, I think. Look, it, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer that question. But let's let's move on to the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. Philippe. Uh, now it looks like that's going to be examined again, mm -hmm. uh, and we know for a fact that people who were donors to the Clinton Foundation did seek to get access to Mrs. Clinton, and, and in some cases did get access to Mrs. Clinton. Just the appearance of that. I mean. You're, are you a lawyer? I think you're a lawyer, right? No, no. Yeah. Thank God, no. Well, the mere appearance of that is not good. It, having a, a, some people who work both for the foundation and they're consulting to the State Department at the same time while they're trying to shepherd people through to meetings with Mrs. Clinton, setting aside politics and all that. And there's, I think, appearance issues plague all politicians. But that one opens up so many questions and always did. It was a tough situation. You had never had a former president with a significant foundation doing good around the world married to a secretary of state. But why were all those the donations, them, millions donated, and then the whole thing dries up after she doesn't become president? Why? I don't know that that's true, but I'll tell you what, what the problem is. A lot of the accusations made against the Clinton Foundation, including by Mr. Schweitzer in Clinton Cash, have been proven wrong. His, uh, in fact, ironically, he sat on this set with Chris Wallace. Uh, when he wrote the book, and Chris, I brought it because it's unbelievable, Chris wrote that um, Clinton took no direction, action, was involved in any way in approving as one of nine agencies of the company. Peter had to admit that he overreached when he said that Secretary Clinton was able to veto it. That's not true. It's a nine-person agency. It's not her decision. But why wouldn't Mrs. Clinton have said, you know, if you're, if you're involved in giving money to the Clinton Foundation, you know, that's great, but... That doesn't that look good. Like, why, why would millions of dollars because be when you, funneled to the Clinton Foundation when there were pending matters before the State Department, important matters that, with the government? I mean, we, we can go through all of them. They're well known. Why would they do that? Why? 
Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, nothing is funneled. Things were donated and made public. They made every penny public going yeah. back Peter to the beginning. Peter has to respond to what you just said about the book, but Peter, go ahead. What Philippe had charged. No, I mean, it, it, it's not true with all due respect. Um, a $2.35 million donation from the chairman of Uranium One as the deal was being approved was not disclosed by the Clinton Foundation. And the Clinton Foundation had to admit that even though you signed an agreement with President Obama saying you were going to disclose every penny. And, you know, call me uh, unfair, but I don't know how you misplace a $2.35 million donation from the chairman of a uranium company whose approval sale to the Russia is being considered at that very time. But, Peter, you wrote that Secretary Clinton had veto power over the deal, and you had to take that back. No, that I correct? did not. Read the book. That, I did not. No, what, <laughs> I, what I said in the book was you the State Department You had to admit Department that you overreached. Of, no, yeah, well, I did not. not. What, I, <laughs> what, what I said in the book was that there were nine government agencies that approved the deal. If any of those agencies, including the State Department, don't agree with the deal, the deal gets halted and kicked up to the president for review. And, by All the right, way, well, in the guys, history of CFIUS... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. The, the, the Committee on Foreign Investment, we can't relitigate that, but this is going to be going yeah. on for some time. I want to have you both back. It's great to have you on, Philippe. Sorry I botched your name like twice, <laughs> but that's, that's just the Happens way it is the on live TV. Uh, and by the way, in a moment, we're going to tell you what the Attorney General did today that could signal the beginning of the end oh, for legal marijuana. That's wishful thinking. Don't go away. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has set the stage for what could turn into a crackdown on legalized marijuana. He issued a memo today reversing several Obama-era directives that discourage enforcement of federal anti-marijuana laws in states that have legalized its use and possession. Joining me now to debate all this is Attorney John Talcott. He's chairman of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, along with Don Murphy of the Marijuana Policy Project. Okay, well, Cory Gardner in Colorado, Senator, uh, said that AG Jeff Sessions' decision to rescind marijuana policy has trampled on the will of the Colorado voters. Wow, John Talcott, what do you think about that Republican Cory Gardner? They get a lot of money, tax money, from the legalized I, marijuana. I, 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 I was very sorry, sorry to hear about Cory Gardner taking that position. I think he's actually said even worse than that. He said he's not going to support any person who's been appointed by. Um, you know, Attorney General Sessions in the next few months until this is all straightened out. I think he's actually, you know, making more of a big deal of this than he should, because ultimately we're just going back to enforcing the law like it used to be enforced. And, and it's the also, current federal law. And the current federal law pro prohibits the use, distribution, you know, sale of marijuana. And he's making it almost like a state rights issue when it's actually a public health issue. And if you look at all of the various things that marijuana has been doing to his state, I'm actually kind of surprised that he would be taking that position. I mean, we've seen a doubling in the number of people who have been killed in drug driving accidents. We've seen, you know, emergency rooms overwhelmed by people reporting that they're suffering from psychosis. We've seen skyrocketing youth uh, use. We've seen, uh, you know, pot shops being put yep. in all the minority areas. And, Don, uh, look, you're an advocate of legalized marijuana. Billions of dollars are on the line. Big celebrity money, big weed money. And this is an initiative that is being pushed and pushed and pushed, I think, without regard to public health. But on the issue of state versus federal authority here, it is currently federal law, as John said, to prohibit recreational use of marijuana, possession, or distribution. If you want to change the law, change the law. So demonizing Jeff Sessions, as some of these people are doing today, these growers who want, you know, just uh, they want to make money off the destruction of, of, of our, our development of young brains and so forth. I guess we can do that, but it's federal law right now until they change it. Well, Jeff Sessions is doing what Jeff Sessions is supposed to do. He's the attorney general and he's supposed to prosecute these sort of things. And he's supposed to say he's going to enforce federal law. That's what L Loretta Lynch said in her confirmation hearings and that's what uh, Jeff Sessions said in his. Whether you want to talk about billions of dollars, public health or, or anything else, I think this is a constitutional amendment. It's a Tenth Amendment issue. And with respect to health issues, I think more and more people are finding that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol. And whether or not you want to debate that, that's a whole different topic. I actually think that the states are capable of enforcing their own law. In, in what realm is well, the they're federal... they're thwarting federal law right well, now. Well, so, 
in what realm is federal law? Uh, what other laws un, should, is, should be should be just willy nilly? Ignored? I actually think I think the states are capable of handling their own state laws, and their voters have passed these laws, and the legislatures have passed these laws, and I don't think the well, what if states? I don't, I don't think the Trump administration should get in the middle of this. This is not necessarily about billions of dollars. In my opinion, it's about very sick people who, by his own admission, the president has said he knows people who use marijuana and he Very he sick knows, people? Like yes. the people who are starting on marijuana and moving to other drugs? 9% are addicted. 9% end up getting addicted daily use to get up I to 17%. I think the real problem are the, are the That's people American that, Academy that, of that start off with so opioids the, and the real, heroin because they well, get addicted well, they, to prescription I totally the vast, the vast majority of people who get addictions to opioids and die from that addiction have started off with pot. Okay, let's just be clear. It doesn't well, mean that every, second, no, yeah. Secondly, let's make it clear. You're from the Marijuana Policy Project. You get paid to be here. I'm here from Smart Approaches to Marijuana. We're trying to come up with a middle road. We're not talking prohibition versus legalization. We're talking about decriminalization and trying to deal with some of the problems that have been identified while also make, maybe making some progress at dealing it. with with the drug policy issues that, you know, some of which are the legitimate that you guys raise. But when it comes right down to it, there's a bad day for the Marijuana Policy Project for one simple reason. Most of the board has invested in the marijuana industry. All those people are trying to make a ton of money off of our kids, I actually getting them addicted. I actually so thought we'd be here to talk out. about the issue and not, you know, personal attacks. And, and to yeah, that extent, I'm a little, little disappointed in that. But look, right, there are very, wrap it up. very sick people who are benefiting from this, right. and I don't think the president should be uh, All right, calling for their arrest. We're out of time, guys. Thank you. For, we'll have you back for sure. Great debate. By the way, up next, something bizarre. You're not going to want to miss it. Bomb cyclones, reptiles. Ooh, stay with us. And now let's go to our own Ingram Angle Doppler radar that tracks weather hyperbole and oddities. As you know, it's cold here on the East Coast, believe it or not, and it's winter time. And it's cold in most of the United States. Shocking. And the effects of the dreaded bomb cyclone have reached even the reptile set in Florida. When temps dipped to below 40 degrees in the Sunshine State today, something odd started happening. Iguanas started dropping from trees. Yum, a frozen treat for the good humor man. Imagine that. The fate of this cute green fellow was chronicled today by the Associated Press. But look, before you weep over his limp, leathery figure, you should know that just because they go belly up, those little green guys aren't necessarily dead. They're just chilling. So bad. Literally. Iguanas are one thing, but what about those pesky invasive species of Burmese pythons that now populate the Florida Everglades? Sorry, kids. Snake haters, well, even the current cold snap will not thin their slithery ranks. They survive. And by the way, I was reminded of this because my son held a python in Florida last week at a reptile show, and I almost had a heart attack. I almost melted down when I saw him. He's the one in the orange. He wanted, yeah, he thought it was cool, and he demanded to hold the uh, alligator at the exhibit as well. Nico, he's not afraid of anything. I, I couldn't even, I had to run. By the way, we'll be right back with some breaking reaction from the president on Michael Wolff's book coming up. Before we go, the president reacting just minutes ago to the latest revelations from Michael Wolff's book, specifically what we talked about just a few minutes ago, the idea that Wolff had kind of unfettered access to the president's staff. Trump tweeting, I authorized zero access to White Ho the White House, actually turned him down many times for author of phony book. I never spoke to him for book full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and Sloppy Steve. Well, <laughs> Sloppy Steve, well, let me just say, he did, uh, you know, according to multiple reports and Wolf himself, he sat in the West Wing on that couch as people walked back and forth and was given access, as it has been reported, by, I think, Hope Hicks, through or she said, gave the green light for various people at the White House to speak with him. And that's the information that we have. The president did not give him an interview. That is correct. But he was cleared into the White House, checked into the Hay Adams Hotel, and spent some time there. 
Um, well, we will see as this develops, and we'll be there every step of the way for you to analyze it. Always follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Check out Billionaire at the Barricades. A lot of barricades to clear now. That's all the time I have tonight. Shannon Bream takes it from here. Miss Shannon.